Hello, and welcome back to Jenna Gets Creative. Today, I am starting a brand new series on this channel. I am going to be doing a series where every episode I pick a different influential historical artist. And I want to pick them from around the world, not just the European-centric artists that we often hear about. So if you have suggestions for influential historical artists from Asia, Africa, Australia, the Americas, Antarctica, outer space, I don't know. <laughs> Drop them in the comments down below. Feel free to make suggestions for future episodes of this series. And uh, so in these episodes, I am going to talk to you about what I have discovered going out and doing my research about the artist in question. And um, full disclosure, I did not go to school for art. I did not actually take any art history courses, but I did at one point in my life spent quite a few years doing a Bachelor of History line of study and history is a big passion of mine so I love it and I love teaching what I find out, what I find fascinating. So I'm going to, in voiceover, be teaching you what I have found out, what I think is important about the artist I selected and in the meantime you're going to be watching me creating a piece of artwork that emulates their style or what was important about what they were doing with art, what everybody else was doing with art at the time. So to start this off, who better? We're gonna do Van Gogh. First, let's talk about pronunciation. In the intro, I pronounced the name Van Gogh, but I grew up pronouncing it Van Gogh. Both are considered acceptable and even correct among English speakers, but of course, neither are correct to a Dutch speaker. Vincent himself would have pronounced the latter syllable of his name with the short O and a hard guttural CH, like in Lach. The best I can do with my Anglophone tongue and my not-so-great hearing is Van Gogh. Forgive me if I'm not consistent during this video or if I butcher other names, <laughs> and note that I filmed the intro before I researched how he would have pronounced it himself. The painting you're watching me work on during this video is a tribute to his style, but I'm using acrylics, which weren't available to him. Van Gogh died in 1890, and acrylic paints are an invention of the 1930s and 40s. Most of his later works are done in oils, but throughout his life he also did work in charcoal, pastel, and watercolors. In my piece, I've used his flowing lines and brush strokes in the water and sky, but I chose to texture the grass on the cliff on the right side of the canvas using a dry brushing technique, so that portion admittedly looks nothing like Van Gogh's style. I've titled my piece Free in the Harbor after the Stan Rogers song, and the setting is referenced from a photo I took at Cape Spear here in Newfoundland. For this video, I think I would like to jump back and forth between presenting a summary of my research on Van Gogh in chronological order of his life and giving my own thoughts. But before we get into that, give me 30 seconds to run through my usual spiel. If you're new here, please don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. I upload every Tuesday and Thursday at minimum, and some weeks I upload bonus videos as well. I'm an art channel, so most of my videos are mainly time-lapse art footage, either with me rambling on about some random topic or walking you through a tutorial or a product review, but sometimes I switch it up and do a craft. If you like this video, don't forget to hit the like button and leave a comment down below. I love reading your comments and I do reply to everyone. Since we're discussing Van Gogh today, let me know what you think of his story or his work and maybe drop a suggestion for who I should cover next time in this artist biography series. Now, let's start with a quick run through of his early life. Vincent van Gogh was born on the 30th of March, 1853, to Dutch Reformed Church minister Theodorus van Gogh and his wife, Anna Cornelia Carbentis. He was their second child, but their first to survive, and he shares his first name with his stillborn older brother. Both were named after his grandfather, also Vincent van Gogh who studied theology and had six sons, half of whom went on to become art dealers. Vincent is noted to be a very common name in his family. His mother's family was said to be prosperous as well and came from the Hogue. In childhood, Vincent was described as thoughtful and serious. His mother started his and his brother's educations at home and encouraged Vincent to draw. Vincent was sent to a boarding school in Zevenbergen in 1864 
at age 11, much to his displeasure. He felt abandoned and begged to return home to study there, but instead he was sent on to more formal schooling and in 1868, age 15, he finally and abruptly returned home to pursue education and interests of his own choosing. At age 16, in July 1869, he started working as an art dealer in The Hague, in a position obtained for him by his uncle with Goupier Company. He trained with them for four years before transferring to London. At age 20, he was working at Goupier's Southampton branch, and for a brief period in his life, Vincent was prosperous, earning more than his father. During this time in his life, he fell in love with Eugenie Loya his landlord's daughter, but she was engaged to someone else and rejected him. By the end of his year in London, following his rejection, Vincent was isolated and increasingly religious. His father and uncle arranged for him to move to Paris in 1875, aged 22, to work at another of Goupy's branches. While there, Vincent became resentful of how commodified art was becoming and ended up being dismissed from employment within that year. In 1876, age 23, he moved back to London and worked unpaid as a supply teacher in Ramsgate. For my fellow North Americans, substitute teacher. He eventually left that job to become an assistant to a Methodist minister for a brief time before returning home for Christmas the same year. He spent six months, starting around Christmas of 1876, working in a bookshop. He hated the job, and he spent his working hours doodling and translating passages from the Bible into English, French, and German. He was extremely religious at this time, and his flatmate observed that he no longer ate meat. I'm not sure if that was out of religious ideology, frugality, or an early sign of mental health interfering with his ability to take care of his physical health. Maybe all of the above. When he left his position at the bookstore, he moved to Amsterdam to live with his uncle, Johannes Stricker, a theologian. This was arranged by his family because of his desire at the time to become a pastor. He prepared for the entrance exam to study theology at the University of Amsterdam, but failed, and left his uncle's home in July 1878. If you're keeping track, that's about a year after leaving the bookstore job before moving to Amsterdam. From there, he went to Laken, which is near Brussels, to undertake a three-month course at a Protestant missionary school, but also failed there. This led him to become a missionary in the coal mining district of Borinage in Belgium in January 1879. His position came with lodging at a bakery, but he gave this up to a homeless man in an attempt to show support for the impoverished congregation he was serving, and lived in a small hut instead. Regardless of what the congregation thought, however, the church authorities were not pleased, and they fired him for, quote, undermining the dignity of the priesthood. Once again, he moved home in March of 1880, shortly before his 27th birthday. This was when his family started to lose patience with him, and his father is noted to have advised him to be committed to an asylum in Kiel. Personally, when I read that, I wasn't sure how to take it. I'm not sure if his family was trying to be supportive and helpful with this suggestion or dismissive. But either way, I doubt it would have been received well. From what I've read, although Van Gogh definitely knew early on in his life that he was mentally ill, nothing I've read leads me to believe that he was ready for, to receive help at this time. And speaking as someone who has dealt with depression, I imagine this would have been quite damaging to his relationship with his father. But Van Gogh didn't go into hospital or asylum yet. He went back to Belgium in August and lodged with a miner for a couple of months. That's miner as in one who works in a mine, by the way. It was during this time that his brother Theo, in his letters back and forth, encouraged him to take up art full time. Vincent started to study the people and scenery around him and capture everything in drawings. Near the end of the year, he moved to Brussels to study with Willem Roloffs, who persuaded Van Gogh to enroll at Académie Royale de Beaux-Arts, which he did and studied anatomy and perspective. At this point, in his late 20s, Van Gogh experienced his second major romantic rejection. This time, the woman he fell in love with was his widowed cousin, Ki, who was seven years his senior and had a son. Apparently, her response when he proposed marriage was, no, nay, never. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> He returned to Amsterdam and Vincent went on to The Hague to meet his second cousin, Anton Mauve. Mauve, who was the commercially successful artist Van Gogh wanted to be, 
encouraged him to work in charcoal and pastels. After several months of Van Gogh's working on his own following Mauve's suggestions, Mauve took him on as a student and introduced him to watercolors, then oils, and eventually lent him money for a studio in January 1882. Their partnership was short-lived, however. Mauve preferred to work from plaster casts as reference, while Van Gogh was constantly hiring live models off the street. Mauve disapproved of this, but Van Gogh insisted that he couldn't learn from casts. By March, Van Gogh and Mauve were no longer on speaking terms, and Vincent was sharing his lodgings with a prostitute named Sin, who was pregnant with her second child. When news of this reached his father, well, use your imagination. Deeply religious 19th century family, minister learns that his unmarried son is living with a prostitute. <laughs> not much is said explicitly in sources I read about whether or not this was a romantic relationship, but I will note here that he continued to live with Saint for a year after his father urged him to leave her, and the child Saint gave birth to during their time together grew up thinking of Vincent as his father, even though we know that this isn't actually the case due to the timing of Saint's pregnancy, and he did leave them at the end of 1883. In 1884, Van Gogh was living in Nenen, focusing on working quickly in outdoor settings. One of his neighbor's daughters, Margot Béchemin, joined him frequently and they eventually did fall in love, though apparently she was much more enthusiastic about the romance than he was, and neither of their families approved of their potential marriage. Margot attempted suicide by overdose on strychnine, but Van Gogh got her to hospital in time to save her. Not much is said about their relationship after that in my readings, but it's clear he moved on shortly after. In 1885, when Vincent complained to his brother Theo that his paintings weren't selling, Theo critiqued his work as being too dark and pointed out that they didn't fit in with the bright Impressionism style. Around this time, he met Pissarro, Monet, and Gauguin, and through seeing their styles and experiencing this new Impressionism firsthand, he started to use brighter colors and embraced the stylized brushstrokes of Impressionism. He wasn't completely able to copy their styles though, and it's noted that he preferred to strive for realism in his works, so his own flavor of Impressionism is much more bold and unconventional than the styles of his peers. He actually confessed at one point that he felt Starry Night strayed too far from realism. I find it funny that he didn't like that piece because it seems to always be the case that we artists are often far too critical of our own work, and usually the pieces we put out into the world that end up garnering the most attention and praise aren't the pieces that we personally are most fond or proud of. By November of 1885, he moved to Antwerp, and he was mostly living in poverty at the time. Throughout his adult life, whenever he was unemployed, his brother Theo was sending him money, but this was mostly spent on art supplies, I can relate, <laughs> and hiring models and feeding his addictions, cigarette and alcohol. His diet was mostly bread and coffee. According to one of his letters to his brother Theo in February 1886, he noticed that he could only recall eating six hot meals since May. During his time in Antwerp, Van Gogh added bright colors like carmine, cobalt blue, and emerald green into his regular palette, and he discovered Japanese woodcuts, which he collected and sometimes traced. Van Gogh studied under several artists at Antwerp Academy, but his style and ideas about art clashed with his instructors, notably with Sibert, and he was required to repeat a year. He drank heavily, notably absinthe, and ended up hospitalized between February and March of 1886 due to poor general health and possibly a second case of syphilis. It isn't clear whether Van Gogh was expelled from the academy or simply didn't return after his stay in the hospital, but in March of 1886 he moved to Paris to live with his brother Theo and studied under Ferdinand Carmont, and he was very interested in painting portraits and still lifes at this time. There's a bit of a gap in what we know about Van Gogh from his letters during the time that he lived with Theo since he had no need to write to him, but by the end of the year tensions were high. Although Theo was always Vincent's closest friend and greatest supporter, he is quoted as saying that living with Vincent by the end of 1886 was almost unbearable. Vincent moved again in early 1887 and began incorporating the still relatively new style of pointillism into his pieces. In 1888, he moved to Arles and began 
one of his more prolific periods as an artist, painting over 200 oils and around 100 drawings and watercolors. His works at this time were of the local landscape, and his signature palette of yellow and ultramarine was prominent in these works. This is also the year when he mutilated his ear during an incident with fellow artist Gauguin. Accounts of that night differ, but we know that Van Gogh experienced a psychotic episode of some sort and recalled hearing voices. Gauguin claims that Van Gogh came at him with a blade and eventually used it on himself. Whatever happened, he was found unconscious the next morning by police and taken to hospital. This marks the end of his close friendship with Gauguin and the beginning of his time as a patient of a Dr. Felix Ray. The official hospital diagnosis given to Van Gogh at the time was acute mania with generalized delirium, and he was ordered to remain in hospital by police. Although Gauguin never met with Van Gogh again in person after this incident, he did write to Theo, prompting Theo to pay his brother a visit in hospital, and Van Gogh and Gauguin continued to correspond in writing. Contrary to pop culture factoids, Van Gogh did not sever his entire ear, he only mutilated part of the lobe. Self-portraits he painted shortly after this incident do feature bandages over that ear, and portraits painted later on always show him at an angle that hides the left side of his head. Side note here, keep in mind when looking at his self-portraits, Van Gogh painted himself from reflections, not photographs, so left and right are flipped. Van Gogh first left the hospital while under Dr. Ray's care in January of 1889 and spent the next month back and forth between the hospital and his home at the Yellow House. He suffered from hallucinations and delusions of poisoning during this time, and 30 townspeople ended up signing a petition to have Van Gogh evicted. His neighborhood called him Le Fourou, the red-headed madman, <laughs> and in April he moved into lodgings owned by his doctor, and then in June voluntarily committed himself to the asylum at Saint-Rémy-de-Provence. He had two cells in the asylum, one of which he used as his studio. This is where he became enchanted with the wheat fields around the asylum and painted the starry night. In 1890, between February and April, he was so depressed that he couldn't write, but he felt actually able to express everything through his art. He asked his mother and brother to send earlier drawings and sketches so that he could paint from them, and also painted from memory, as Theo suggested. His work became very symbolic. Van Gogh wrote that the wheat fields in his paintings represented sadness and extreme loneliness, and said to his brother in a letter that the canvases will tell you what I cannot say in words. Van Gogh died on the morning of July 29, 1890, after shooting himself in the chest 30 hours earlier on the evening of the 27th. There were no witnesses, and rumors abound regarding the circumstances, but experts on his life seem to agree that this was a genuine suicide. The initial gunshot wound didn't damage any vital organs, and the bullet stopped on his spine, thus causing no exit wound, so Vincent was able to walk home. He was attended by two doctors, but no surgeon was available, so the bullet could not be removed. When Theo arrived in the morning on the 28th, Vincent was in good spirits, but as the hours passed, infection set in and he couldn't be saved. According to Theo, Vincent's last words were, The sadness will last forever. Theo himself was in poor health at the time, made worse by the emotional pain of losing his brother, and died just six months later in January of 1891. Theo's wife Johanna had his body exhumed and reburied next to Vincent's at Auvers-sur-Oise, where both graves are still located today. Personal side note here, but as a mother, thank God, they also had sisters. Their mother outlived both of them and their father, passing away at the age of 88 in 1907. I can't imagine living that long without having anyone left at all, but presumably she was survived by her daughters. At this point, I would like to discuss two topics in a little more detail before we end the video. Van Gogh's health and his paintings. First, let's address his health. It is known that Vincent van Gogh suffered seizures throughout his life, presumably due to a brain lesion present at birth and exacerbated by his heavy drinking. Doctors believe he suffered specifically from temporal lobe epilepsy, which is a form of epilepsy featuring focal seizures isolated or starting in the temporal lobe. These seizures can occur with or without loss of consciousness and generally don't produce the tonic-clonic or grand mal seizures you're probably thinking of. 
Focal onset seizures are split into two categories, focal aware and focal impaired awareness. During a focal aware temporal lobe seizure, the sufferer is fully conscious and aware but may experience some neurological symptoms including amnesia, unprovoked fear or anxiety, nausea, hallucinations, visual distortions, dissociation, and dysphoric emotions. Remember that ear mutilating incident? Auditory hallucinations, unprovoked fear or anxiety, dissociation, amnesia, dysphoric emotions. At the time he was diagnosed with an acute manic episode, but it seems to me that he might have actually had a seizure. It's also interesting to note that Van Gogh's epilepsy was treated for years using a medicine called digitalis, derived from foxgloves, by the way, which is known to cause yellow spots or a yellow cast in vision, and Van Gogh loved to use yellow in his artwork. Additionally, it's very likely that Van Gogh suffered from both thujon poisoning and lead poisoning. Thujon is a toxin in absinthe, Van Gogh's drink of choice to drown out his depression, anxiety, and neurological symptoms of his epilepsy. Symptoms of Thujon poisoning are also a cause of yellow cast on one's vision, and constant exposure to the toxin definitely didn't improve his epilepsy. Lead poisoning is all but guaranteed, as his doctors observed during Van Gogh's time in the asylum, that he would try to eat paint and drink kerosene during his attacks, as they called them. Lead poisoning can cause the retinas of our eyes to swell, which produces the swirling halos around lights similar to what we see in some of Van Gogh's paintings, like The Starry Night. It's also likely that he suffered from sunstroke often during his painting sessions in the fields, which, combined with symptoms of his epilepsy, would certainly explain the bad stomach he complained about in his letters. Many doctors and psychologists have speculated that Van Gogh may have suffered from a form of bipolar disorder because of his cyclic episodes of severe depression interspersed with periods of high functioning and hyper focus, though it is hotly debated and ultimately we can't know without being able to interview him. He absolutely did suffer from depression, but whether that was an illness in and of itself for Van Gogh or part of something else isn't known. Just from personal observation here, I'd like to point out that his behavioral patterns during the times when he was not depressed in his adult years are very similar to adult symptoms of ADHD, and his many short and often volatile interpersonal relationships combined with his self-destructive behaviors also remind me of borderline personality disorder. Yes, by the way, I have studied psychology at the university level. That was my minor during my years as a Bachelor of History student. No, I am not trying to compete with the experts and refute their conclusions. I'm just offering my own somewhat educated opinion. I'd also like to note that the Wikipedia article on Van Gogh mentions another possible medical diagnosis of acute intermittent porphyria. So let's look at that quickly. This is one of the few forms of porphyria that doesn't come with any sort of photosensitivity, and it's very common for patients with the mutation to go decades without showing symptoms leading to diagnosis. The average age of diagnosis is 36, the ear incident and voluntary commitment to the asylum were in 1888, making Van Gogh 35. One of the most common symptoms when it is noticed is abdominal pain, and we already know Van Gogh had stomach issues. This form of the disease can lead to psychiatric symptoms similar to schizophrenia, like paranoia, and in rare cases, hallucinations and psychosis. Caesar medications are among the list of known triggers for acute attacks. The Van Gogh Gallery website also mentions hypergraphia, which is a compulsion to write. I would assume this is prompted by the fact that he wrote over 800 letters to his brother, and many more to other recipients, but I don't believe this one because as far as we know, he didn't keep a diary or any other personal collections of writing. Whenever he was with his brother, the writing stopped. This tells me he was just writing so much because he was keeping in contact with Theo, and because it was the 19th century, he couldn't just pick up a phone or send off a text message whenever he had something to say. Now let's move on to discussing his artworks. With Van Gogh, you have portraits, still lifes, landscapes, and very little else. On the portraits, Van Gogh is quoted as saying they were the only thing in painting that moves me deeply and gives me a sense of the infinite. He aimed to capture emotions, color, and character, and allowed himself to stray from realism in little ways in order to capture those things. He hoped that his portraits would endure, and he saw them as his only real opportunity to earn from his art. 
His self-portraits mostly come from periods where he didn't have other people to paint, and because of this, they're quite interesting. He's very self-critical with these works. He rarely depicted himself as the painter, and he always included all of his physical flaws. Nothing is idealized or smoothed over. Any observant person, even without knowing who Van Gogh is, or what his life was like, can look at his portraits and know that he was a physically and mentally ill person, and even pinpoint which portraits came from times when he was more ill than others. It's also interesting to note that he rarely painted himself looking directly at the viewer, and one of the only exceptions to this was his final self-portrait, painted in September of 1889 as a birthday gift for his mother. Many of his still lifes were studies of flowers. The two series of sunflowers he's known for, and which he was very proud of, were a step away from symbolism. He painted those in anticipation of Gauguin's visit and sought to display his technical skill. When he wrote to Theo about painting the sunflowers, he noted how he had to complete those pieces all in one sitting because the cut flowers wilted and died so quickly. Having tried oils very little and knowing how long they take to dry and how easily it is to create mud when you try to put too many wet layers on top of wet layers, I've come to appreciate those paintings more than my initial opinions. At face value, I don't like his sunflowers. They're very monochromatic, and while that isn't necessarily a bad thing, the colors are also very muted. Flowers, vase, table, wall, all in varying shades of mustard. <laughs> Not really appealing in my opinion, but I recognize and appreciate the skill it took to capture those complete images so quickly in such a slow medium. I'm also willing to concede that the hues may have been brighter a hundred years ago. His landscapes are where I really fall in love with his work, and not just the starry night, which is indeed very captivating. I love how his swirly brushstrokes capture the movement of grass and trees and wind and make his scenes feel alive. I love the attention to natural contrast between blue skies, green trees, and yellow wheat. Some of them include people working the fields, and I love how peacefully and honestly he captured their everyday lives. Those paintings show his recognition and appreciation for things in the outside world that were good and healthy and thriving. I get the sense that he looked out at the wheat fields that he could see from the asylum and saw hope, even if he didn't know how to feel hope himself. He recognized it, idolized it, and tried to show what he saw to others through his paintings. They also capture his own feelings of isolation. He didn't feel like part of the world that he captured. He didn't feel like hope and the life he saw in the wheat fields was something he could experience. The canvases will tell you what I cannot say in words.